Hello everyone, this is Putnam County historian Larry Tippin. We've been doing a series on early history of Putnam County and some of the tiny towns, vanished villages, and some of the communities. Today I'd like to talk about the founding of Greencastle. We can't talk about everything that happened in the early history of Greencastle. I'm just going to talk about the founding, how it came to be, and when, and so forth. Let's start out with the act that created Putnam County. We discussed this in a separate presentation of the county itself, the founding of the county, but some of this is relevant to the founding of Greencastle. The official title for this act, act for creation of a new county out of Owen and Vigo, bounded and north of Owen. This is actually the handwritten act that created the county, still on file, with the county clerk's office, the courthouse in Greencastle, signed December 31st, 1821. Part of this, I apologize, it's hard to read. Again, it's 200 years old almost. Said it created a county named Putnam. And this act named five men, five, five specific men. If you'd like to pause and read some of the slides, you can do so, but I'm moving on who were given the duty to fix the seat of justice of Putnam County, or the county seat. They were told to convene at the house of James Athey in Putnam County the first Monday of May next, which is May 6, 1822. James Athey had built his log cabin, winter of 1818, 19, 18, 18, 19, in Orton Township, Putnam County. One of the problems it had was trying to find a place where there's actually a community because there really weren't any. And also the boundaries are significantly different in 1821 and 1822 as they are now. This dashed line represents the original boundaries of the county as defined in that original act of 1821. You can see that only a small part of what's now Putnam County is actually included in that. The county changed shapes five times, talk about that, in the uh, creation of the county. But you can see that there's really nothing here, no communities. Well, what about Putnamville, Pleasant Garden, Reelsville? Well, none of those places existed in 1822 when they're trying to find the seat of justice or fix the seat of justice, I should say. The National Road didn't come through 1828 and then those communities are almost 10 years away. So none of those could have been considered for the seat of justice. And then December of 1822, the lines of Putnam County were redrawn where Greencastle was more or less in the middle of it, although it did change shape three more times. And then a new act, January of 1823, the legislature was not pleased with these five men noting they failed to perform the duty assigned them. And this new act, January of 1823, they named five new men, five different men. Going to the next slide, pause if you'd like to read it. Who were to convene at the, ho the home of John Butcher in Putnam County, who by this time has acquired land from the government north and a little bit west of Green Council along Big Walnut Creek about his cabin. The second Monday of April next is when they were to meet. Now there's a lot of confusion by this phrase, second Monday of April next. Some people have misinterpreted that to mean next year. So we have a lot of uh, incorrect information in some of our historical records because of that. It means the next time that falls on the calendar, whether it's this year or next. So then the second Monday, of May, of April next, excuse me, from January 7th, 1823, is actually April 14th, 1823. These five men did meet and they did select the newly platted community of Greencastle as a seat of justice, which had been platted by Ephraim Dukes at about that time. We'll talk about that as we go. Also wanted to say that Ephraim Dukes, 
then transferred title of Greencastle, New New Plata Town, to Amos Robertson, the first agent for the county of Putnam. And Amos Robertson then wasted no time in advertising for sale of lots. This, this would be the second Monday of September next, September 8th, 1823, to the advertisement in several newspapers, one in August, beginning June 15th, 1823, talking about Green Castle, describing it a little bit. And then by law, Amos Robertson gets 10% of the sale of those lots, partly to compensate him for his time, but also his out-of-pocket expenses because he ran this advertisement for eight weeks in various newspapers. Not long after this, Ephraim Duke's son-in-law, John Wesley Clark, had deeded to John Baird, the second land agent or agent of Putnam County, the adjoining 80 acres, which collectively between Duke's and Clark's land made up the city of Greencastle. Baird then wasted no time in advertising for the second sale of lots in the town of Greencastle which would be the first commencing, the first Monday of June next, which would be June 6, 1824. See that he's talking about Greencastle now a little bit, saying that we have a grist mill and a sawmill. Also that only three years ago, it had been a complete wilderness. And now it perhaps has more than 400 families, which perhaps, is a great exaggeration. I'm sure there wasn't anywhere near that many, but that's okay because we've got to sell the lots. This is the land patent for the portion that was there from Dukes of those two properties that made up the city of Greencastle. The actual land patent you can get from the Bureau of Land Management's website and you can view these says Ephraim Dukes of Monroe County, Indiana. We'll just explore why that's so critically important. Of Monroe County, Indiana. It talks about the legal description, so forth, so on. Part of Section 21 of what's now Greencastle Township, which became part of the city of Greencastle. Signed by James Monroe, February of 1822. But Dukes had applied for this patent, January of 1821, land patent, is the first deed or the first sale of land for the United States government to the first settler. That's what a land patent is. It takes about a year or more for the, process, uh, the land patent to be processed. So I applied for it January of 1821 and it's signed February of 1822. Now I wanna explore some of the historical records and how that relates to founding Green Castle. This is the Alice of Putnam County and also history, statistics, and illustrations by the J.H. Beers and Company of Chicago, published 1879. This is just a photocopy of the cover of that. We have a very high quality reproduction of this atlas available for sale at the Putnam County Museum, if somebody would like to look at it. It's a very nice document. Now, the background and the history of this, this Beers Company, Chicago, published quite a few of these atlases for different counties, including Hendricks in 1878, Montgomery, and all over the Midwest. So we see some newspaper articles related to that. We see one September 5th, 1878, in the banner where William Reagan, secretary of the Horticultural Society, writes the Beers and Company firm and saying that he's compiling the notes of plots, a description of the horticultural atlas, because I'm sure they mean the historical atlas. Now, William Reagan, he was the son of Reuben Reagan, who was the first noted horticulturalist of Putnam County and one of the founders, as William was, very noted person saying that he wrote to the Beers and Company of Chicago, said, I have been given your historical atlas of Hendricks County, one published in 1878, a careful and thorough examination, and do not hesitate to say I'm well pleased with the work. 
the maps and plots of towns and villages are correct even to the smallest detail. In the historical portion, I recognize a few inaccuracies, which are, however, not due to the fault of the publisher saying that they were given some information that was not fact-checked and so forth. And then November of 1878, the banner saying, Happy Learn, that the firm, Gage, Beers, and Company, has been at work for a time endeavoring to get the historical items to the county and has received sufficient number of subscriptions to warrant the publication. We also learned they now propose to offer opportunity to a few of the leading citizens of different townships to have sketches made in connection with the history. So this company has been doing this a long time. They know what to do and how to get these books sold. So what they do is they get biographical sketches of families all over the county, maybe a hundred or more. And of course, if you see your family has a biographical sketch, there's a good chance you're gonna buy this book. And that's how they sold so many of their books by those biographical sketches, which are absolutely wonderful if you're doing your family history or genealogy, because it has dates, uh, where they came from, children, and so forth. Very, very valuable information. And then we see February 13th, 1879, the officials of Putnam County has examined the historical atlas and pronounced it a credit to our county. So this is when it is published, February of 1879, or just prior to that, early February 1879. Now I wanna note a few things about this book. It has a lot of maps of the counties, and we have to remember that those maps do not represent 1879. This document, or this publication, does not cite its sources, which in my opinion is a gross uh, shortcoming of any historical document. So they don't know where they got the information. We don't know the time period representing in the maps, because it could have been 1879 because it's published early February. So I've actually done a research in the, the deeds and title transfers in the courthouse trying to establish when the cutoff might have been. And there's no clean cutoff of where the prior owners and new owners of the people, of the property owners in the Atlas. Some in 1877, some 1878, some show the old owners, some the new owners, so forth, so on. So there's no clean cutoff, but it represents the maps of about 1877, 1878, and the sources in the historical part is not, are not cited either. But we have noted in research, particularly of our tiny towns, Vanish villages, where some of that information actually came from. The history of the county was written by Dr. Ridpath, and the townships I don't think were written by Dr. Ridpath. It might have been compiled by him, but more than likely by the Beers and Company, the publisher, from previously published uh, newspaper articles and so forth, such as this one, which is 1877, History of Jackson Township by James Cooper, a long-term resident of the county. So in these um, reminiscent recollections of early history, we have these people that are now in their, in their 70s, sometimes in the 80s, trying to remember what happened 50 years prior to that. Wonderful information in this. You also see here that the editor of the banner is soliciting more of these, and he did get more. So we can directly link some of the township histories in the 1879 Atlas back to these different articles in the mid 1870s. And particularly in this one, we can see that the Jackson Township history in the 1879 Atlas, as we discuss in our uh, tiny towns and vanished villages of New Maysville in more detail, we can see specific phrases from this article that made it to the 1879 Atlas. Although the 1879 Atlas took great liberties and omitted some valuable information from these source documents and changed a few days. Don't know why they did that. Made some errors, some typos, and so forth and so on. 
Then we have this. This is published in the Banner in 1869, a full 10 years before the 1879 Atlas, where these group of people meeting at the law office of Jonathan Jennings and decided they're going to create the Pioneer Association of Putnam County and solicited the members to furnish the uh, records and so forth, the recollections of the county, which they did. We'll discuss that here later in a few minutes. And now we see what some of the sources of the 1879 Atlas were and how some liberties were taken and some errors were made and so forth. We can discuss what we know of the history of the founding of Greencastle, although there are inaccuracies in the dates and other things. It says on page six of the 1879 Atlas, that part of the city which lies between Locust and Indiana was granted by Ephraim Dukes, which he had entered in January of 1821, and deeded to Amos Robertson, agent of Putnam County, in September of 1823, in consideration of location of the county seat at that place. That was one of the, because I've seen that deed, and the transfer of title and it specifically says that, specifically says that consideration of this Green Castle being selected as a seat of justice, which it was. And the west half of that plot was given by son-in-law of Dukes, John Wesley Clark, to John Baird, the second agent of Putnam County. I also made this claim that Mr. Dukes came from Green Castle, Pennsylvania, and the county seat of Putnam County was named in honor of that place. For many of us, this is the first time we've seen that claim, although I'll show you where it came from, and we'll discuss that at length. And also, in the deed, Dukes Reserve, lots 193 and 194 of Greencastle, and that's right in the deed. Also, part of the 1879 Atlas, noted that John Jennings, still living in Greencastle, the oldest continuous resident of Greencastle, put up the first cabinet shop and had he constructed a wheat fan made out of wood. And then also it noted that the first Sunday school, Greencastle was organized by Miss Myra Jewett, who later married John Jennings. And then also, the first goods sold by a resident merchant near Greencastle were sold by Joseph Thurnberg in 1823, and the first store opened for business in Greencastle, owned and operated by General Joseph Orr, who died in 1878 in Laporte, Indiana. We're going to explain why that's important. He commenced selling goods at Greencastle in 1823 on the north side of the square near the northwest corner. A lot of the information that we just viewed came from this article. This is an article in the banner, 1869, 10 years prior, based on the solicitation that that Pioneer Association had given. And you see, this is number 11. Let's zoom in on this. I looked and found some of those preceded this. Some of them were by um, Dr. Stevenson. Some of them by Colonel Farrow. They're reminiscing about what it was like when they came here and so forth and so on, the livestock and so on, all these kind of things. And not a lot of history, but this one has a ton of history in it. You got to remember this John Jennings is trying to recollect what happened 50 years prior. This is memory's not quite as good as it could have been, but it has a lot of valuable information. He said, Came to Greencastle November 1st, 1826, being in his 25th year. A large part of what was then known as town was still a woods, a wilderness. He bought lot 195. Jumping around a little bit, he noted that Duke's reserve lots 193, 194, which we know. And then here he's made the claim that Mr. Dukes came from near Greencastle, Pennsylvania, and our town was named after that place by him. So this is where that claim is first made, repeated 10 years later in 1879. We're going to see that uh, we have problems with that issue. He didn't cite his source. 
If he was in Lot 195, he lived near Duke's, although Duke was buying and selling other properties too, so we don't know if they're, if they're neighbors. So we don't know, and he didn't say if Duke's told him that. So we don't know where this claim came from. We're gonna see why there's some problems with that. He's talking about the first school by Miss Myra Jewett, who became his wife. And also this first sale of lots of Greencastle took place on September 7th, 1823, which is a Sunday. It was actually September 8th. And the score, the, he notes some of this first sale. If you don't want to pause and look at it, you can, but we're going to look at this again later when we show the maps of Greencastle so we can show you where these locations were on the map. If you want to pause, you can, but I'm going to move on. Again, we're going to see this again later. Noted that in 1826, Dr. Knight, Dr. Stevenson, Alexander Stevenson commenced practice of medicine. And then that Jennings then had the honor of starting the first cabinet shop, which we see repeated in 1879, that was, and made the first sweet mill seen in Putnam County made of wood, running gears and all, and also built the first electrifying machine seen in Greencastle which had a great deal of sport shocking those unacquainted with the electric machine. I'm sure they had quite fun with that. You've probably seen that in your uh, science class at high school. And then he's saying when Green Castle was first laid out, it's one half square mile, contained 100 and actually 50 acres. That part of the city which lies east of Indiana was donated money by Dukes and then west by John Wesley Clark. And also saying it was entered Land patent was entered January of 1821. And he's now he's claiming the first man who sat on Green Castle was Ephraim Dukes who moved there in 1822, 1822. Silas Weeks family was the next or the second. He's saying that Weeks was a man near seven feet tall. And the next was Jubilee Dewees who had a tavern in the old log house where James Talbot kept the first post office in 1840. And also notes the first uh, child born and so forth. But let's talk about the post office in 1840. There's a publication called Postmasters 1832 to 1971, where the Postmaster General has a handwritten ledger of the post office and the appointment of the postmasters this is the part that's 1832 to 1844. Let's look at that. And sure enough, James Talbot was in fact appointed postmaster June 19th, 1840, but he was not the first. The first entries in that book were of Blakesburg, Greencastle, Manhattan, Russellville, and Swanksville. We talked about those communities in separate presentations. I think it's worth viewing. But Louis Sands was appointed postmaster of Greencastle. It's kind of hard to read. On June 20th, 1826, but he was not the first. To get prior to 1832, Tony and I went to the National Archives. We chose to go to Atlanta. Could have went to DC or Denver, went to Atlanta, and actually had to scroll through a large series of microfilms. And you see they're very hard to read. But this is the first appointment of postmasters, 1789 to 1832. And we find Greencastle, Putnam, Indiana, Joshua Lucas was appointed postmaster the 15th day of March, 1824. Very clearly, 1824, apparently given $7 for his duties. Who believed that he was the first postmaster. And we'll show you where Joshua Lucas had his first properties, or more than likely the post office as we go. But he was apparently the first. Now there was a suggestion had been made that Greencastle may have been a satellite post office for Vincennes, but we don't have any documentation to prove that. So this would make sense. Greencastle was founded in 1823, the first sale of property, September of 1823. And then here's a few months later, March, we have a postmaster. Going back to that article in 1869, John Jennings saying he remembers a small schoolhouse on lot 192 on the west side of that lot. 
He didn't say that was the first schoolhouse. He may not have even known. He came in 1826. So we don't really know. We just say that he said there was one on the west side of Lot 192. We'll look at that. And then he's a subscription church, the most Methodist Episcopal church. And then where it was located and so forth. They also noted that Amos Robertson, a good man, a member of the church and a state senator, was on a roof. Uh, on the roof of the house, fitting on roofing. So we'll talk about that a little bit. If you wanted something done, you had to do it yourself. If you wanted to build a house, you had to build a house. So he's talking about Robinson doing that. He being the first agent of Putnam County. Now, if you want to read that entire article, you can go to the Hoosier Chronicles. The website is newspapers.library.in.gov, or you can just Google or whatever search engine you prefer to use and go to Hoosier Chronicles. I typed in Dukes, selected 1869. You can actually go down by the month or even the date. That's where I got that article. If you want to see it, you can. It's got other information in it. Now, I've been working and in contact with several descendants of Ephraim Dukes who are doing family history. They've worked at it a long time, worked very hard at it. We've actually exchanged some information. I've given them some primary source documents here in Putnam County, which helped them. But we all agree that this is the most authoritative and accurate history of the Dukes family. This is a biographical sketch of typical new white Jasper Newton Benton Warren and Pulaski County of Indiana, published by the Lewis Company of Chicago, 1899. We're going to look at some of this. This is a biographical sketch of James Ross Dukes, a grandson of Ephraim Dukes, saying he was born 1833 in Cass County son of Ephraim and Jane Esslinger Dukes. Ephraim Dukes is Ephraim Dukes Jr., although he never used the Jr., which makes the research quite difficult. We we'll have to sort out when you see Ephraim Dukes, which one it is. But Ephraim Dukes Sr. is the one that founded Green Castle, and this is the son, Ephraim Dukes Jr. This goes on to say the family was of Irish descent. The great grandfather, meaning Ephraim Dukes Sr.'s father, the founder of Greencastle's father, came from Ireland. And then his mother was German. The grandfather of our subject was Ephraim Dukes Sr., who was the founder of Greencastle, who in his early youth followed the sea, having been a sea captain, who was employed on the water for 15 years by his uncle, Robert Groves. That's valuable information. That's likely his mother's maiden's name. After coming inland, he followed the trade of a shoemaker working out in Indiana. He was a native of Maryland, as was his wife, named Rebecca Miller. They moved to Kentucky in 1796, Ohio in 1801, 1818 to Monroe County, Indiana, not Putnam yet. And then later to LaPorte County, where he died in 1839, at the age of 79 years. His children were Ephraim Jr., Elizabeth, who'd married John Wesley Clark. She had five children. Clark died, and then in uh, LaPorte County in 1846, she married Levi Moore, who died soon after that. Continuing, pause if you'd like to read it. Ephraim Dukes Jr. was born on his father's farm June 17, 1801, near Lexington, Kentucky. Soon after his birth, the family moved to Claremont County, Ohio, which is near Cincinnati, southwestern Ohio, where they lived for 17 years, moving in March of 1818 to Monroe County. It's actually Monroe County is where they moved, not Putnam, in 1818. We know that for a fact. And we can verify a lot of this information, including we see Duke Sr., the founder of Greencastle, and the tax list of Claremont County, Ohio in 1806, 1810, and then other documented information. And then we saw in that land patent that was applied for in 1821, Ephraim Dukes of Monroe County, Indiana, applied for the patent in Putnam County. 
He's always taken advantage of opportunities to suppose the land is proper. He's a land speculator. They're talking about Dukes Jr., but Dukes Sr. was also a land speculator. Talk about some of that. Dukes Jr. in July of 1828 went to Cass County and then two years later returned to Putnam and then back to Cass. If you'd like to read a little bit, pause. I'm moving on to the next slide. Dukes Jr., the son of Ephraim Dukes, the founder of a green castle, learned the trade canner, worked at that business until he moved to Logansport, and then he was a farmer and land speculator. He was a man of deep religious conviction, and then apparently was a preacher beginning in the 20th year. We're going to see the irony of that in just a second. Again, pause if you'd like to read it. His wife, Jane Esslinger Dukes, was 64 when she died, native of Memphis, Tennessee, came to Indiana with her parents in 1818. On September 22nd, 1822, she married Ephraim Dukes, Jr. If you'd like to read more about her, move on. We can see the marriage records. Putnam County. This is the index of marriage records. Now you have to remember the county didn't even have a courthouse in 1828. Though these marriage records were kind of loosely kept, mostly scribbled out on paper and so forth. This is the index. There's quite a story about the first marriage, which is included in uh, Weeks 1910 history. I also talked about that in founding the county. The second one was Andrew Esker and Sally Dukes, brother and sister of Ephraim Dukes Jr. and Jane Esslinger that we saw. They were the very second one. See, that's page one. But the bottom of page three, bottom of page three, we see Ephraim Dukes and Jane Esslinger. Typed in 1826, somebody wrote in 1825, no date or month. All of these people were married, as most people were, their early marriages by Reuben Clearwalders. Now, we're not real sure if the claim 1822 is correct or if the marriage took place in 1825 because it's so scribbled and hard to read. Um, so 1822, 1825, but this is interesting. In the NS Sentinel, December 30th, 1820, the legislature and the Senate on that date, on November 11th of 1820, a bill from the Senate divorcing Ephraim Dukes Jr. from his wife, Martha Dukes, was read the third time and passed. I don't know why Ephraim Dukes Jr. took an act of legislature for him to get divorced, but he was married, previous to Mary Jane, uh, marrying Jane Esslinger to this Martha, and then the legislature had to prove his divorce. This is the only time we see Ephraim Dukes Jr., but we know this is uh, the son of the founder of Green Castle. That's kind of interesting. So let's summarize what we've learned about Ephraim Dukes so far. He was born in Maryland about 1760, maybe a year or two later, employed 15 years at sea by his uncle Robert Groves and became a sea captain himself. He moved to Lexington, Kentucky in 1796 as that place was being developed. Several of his children were born in Lexington, Kentucky and up to and including 1801, Go on the next slide, at which time the family moved to Claremont County, Ohio, where we see Dukes in the tax list of that place, 1806-1810, moved to Monroe County, Indiana in 1818. The whole family moved. You can see all of them, including by this time grandchildren of Ephraim Dukes Sr. Applied for his land patent, January of 1820, 80 acres, section 21 of Greencastle Township. The patent was granted, signed February 22, 1822, noted that Dukes was of Monroe County, Indiana. That's critically important. And then in the deeds, the deed itself, Ephraim Dukes and his wife Rebecca conveyed to Amos Robertson, designated as agent for Putnam County, 70 of those 80 acres. And September 22nd, it's kind of unclear whether the agreement had been made and then was signed September 22nd because we saw that lots were being sold September the 8th. With that land donated consideration, the site being the seat of government or the seat of justice or county seat, if you will, Putnam County. 
And then his son-in-law, John Wesley Dukes, that uh, same consideration to John Baird for his 80 acres, which became part of Greencastle. It's unclear when that was signed. It wasn't recorded until about two years later. And then Dukes like, like platted Greencastle in 1823. Don't know exactly the date. But the plot was recorded in plot book one in the recorder's office in June of 1824. Very hard to read, it's almost 200 years old. Then in that deed, Dukes reserved for himself lots 193-194. And then, and he was in Putnam County until 1836 when he sold his Greencastle loss and moved to Laporte with General Joseph Orr. Remember, we said that he was important. We know that they moved together to Laporte, and, and General Orr died in 1878. Dukes died in 1839, age of 79, having never lived in Pennsylvania. So we cannot see why anybody would say he came from Greencastle, Pennsylvania, because there's absolutely no documentation of any kind, and there's not enough gaps in time where he would have lived in Pennsylvania. Greencastle, Pennsylvania is a real place. It's in South Central Pennsylvania, about 30 or 40 miles west of a sleepy little crossroads community called Gettysburg. You may have heard of that place. This is the website for Greencastle, Pennsylvania. If you're a borough of about 4,000 people, and I, instead of copy and pasted it, I just typed it out, but here's a seal from their website. The Green Council of Pennsylvania was founded by John Alston in 1782, named for Green Castle, Ireland, which is in Northern Ireland, where many of the ancestors of settlers of Green Castle, Pennsylvania came from. And of course, I'm going to have to find out where that is, so I did. So Green Castle is right along the northern coast of Ireland. You see this, this little bay harbor kind of thing. It is a, a fishing and sea community, and it does have a medieval castle. You can see another map that represents where it's at, the very northern part of Ireland. So I'd researched, and several of the descendants of Dukes noted the research, trying to find if the Dukes family was in Maryland. And we found out that, yes, there were Dukes in Maryland. A series of publications by this Peter Coldham summarized some land patents and other records of Maryland. This is before 1700. We have James Duke and Mary Duke in Calvert County, which is right here on the west part of the Chesapeake Bay is coming in. And then a Robert Dukes in Somerset County which is on the east side of that Chesapeake Bay. And then the next series, 1701, 1730, we see a Christopher Duke and a Robert Dukes, Robert Dukes being in Dorchester County, also in here. So we see all these Dukes right here, and it makes sense that they would be of sea, of sea captains and so forth. We've not been able to connect any of these Dukes that are from Dukes, it's quite frustrating. There's not enough documentation. But we can prove there were some dukes along the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland in the right time period in the 1700s. So I have pretty good uh, indication of that claim made in that history of the, all those counties in Indiana that there was a seagoing family would be true. And then it did say they came from Ireland. Then there's this. This is 1819. Taken from the Greensburg Gazette, we're talking about Chambersburg and Hagerstown, two communities in eastern Indiana. Talking about a blacksmith at Greencastle advertises his rates. Now, we don't know if this was Greencastle. If so, it would have been actually a couple of years before Dukes took out his land patent and came to Greencastle. We do know that there were people in Putnam County and in the area of Greencastle prior to Duke's coming. And we don't know if the claim made by John Jennings was accurate. We know Duke took out the land patent for what became Greencastle. He would, would have been the first person at the physical location of Greencastle. But we know there were people around him in Greencastle and Madison, particularly Washington Townships, 
prior 1821. So this claim, this green, this block with the Green Castle would indicate there's at least a possibility that Green Castle already had its name before Dukes ever came. Can't say for sure, and that could be a typo. They could have meant Newcastle. Because they're talking about communities in eastern Indiana, but it says Green Castle. We could find no other Green Castle in eastern Indiana or anywhere else in the state of Indiana except for the one in Putnam County. Green Castle was incorporated as a town in 1849 and it became a city in 1861. Let's look at primary documents. This is a um, recording of the proceedings of the state legislature, the Senate, which met and basically engrossed Hospital 271. The corporate town of Green Castle suspended the rules at all three readings, and it became the town, corporate town, in 1849. On July 8th, as reported on July 11th, 1861 in the banner, the citizens of Green Castle voted they would be a city. So that's when they became a city. Look at the maps. Maps are always fun. So the map, this is from 1869, or 1864, excuse me. According to the Library of Congress, you can find this online. It's very nice. This was the original boundaries of Green Castle, bounded by Liberty to the north, Hannah to the south, Locust, and then Gillespie. I'm going to zoom in on some of this. Okay, so we took that 1869 article from John Jennings and kind of laid it here so we can look at some of these places. The first set of Lot 91 was to John Talbot. Lot 91 is on the southwest corner of the courthouse square. These are ones, not sevens, by the way. That's Lot 91. Lot 92 now known as the Stormberg Block, so Joseph Thornburg. It's Lot 92, and it goes up and then back down. Lot 100, known as the Ash Lot, was sold to Jubilee Deweese. And then look at some of the others, Paul's be like, down to where Joshua Lucas acquired Lot 113, which is the northwest corner of the courthouse square. And since he was the first postmaster in 1824, there's a good chance that's where the first post office was. In 1840, it was noted as being on the north side of the square. And then we know that lots 193 and 194 were reserved by Dukes, which were these two lots. And also that lot 192, the western part, which had that school that John Jennings noted, would be right here. Also note what we now know is called Avenue was first called Ephraim Street, apparently in honor of Ephraim Dukes. I want to show you this, um, which has a planing mill on Walnut Street, just north of where the fire department is now. In 1879, they're talking about a fire that broke out the night of October 28, 1874, about 1030 of the night at the planing mill of Kimball and Son. And then a brisk gale from the southwest carried the fire and flattened about four or five, uh, in four or five hours, six squares, best businesses said that 37 business houses, 12 dwellings, two livery stables, the hotel, one hotel, one furniture factory, one express office, a post office, a number of outhouses, and a vast amount of personal property were consumed by the fire. So this is 1879, looking back just five years prior, but let's find some primary source documents. Indianapolis News on October 29th saying, talking about the destruction of the fire, Green Castle in flames. The fire is the work of an arsonist. And talking about the first information, danger, so forth, so on. The mayor of Green Castle asked Indianapolis and her both to provide firefighting equipment because Green Castle had none. Saying this article says that Green Castle, notably and very near criminally deficient fire protection, had not even organized a bucket brigade. 
And it was also noted that Campbell, the owner, had surveyed his building just a half hour before the fire started. And they were sure it was an arsonist. That they had just a few small fire extinguishers and so forth, but no real fire apparatus. That the fire ran quickly over the square and the south of the block, Wharton Street, and then directly upon the courthouse. Burn runs square east of Washington Street, cross over and burn opposite side on the north, continued entire length of the, of the block, except for the National Bank building. That's significant, and I'll show you why. And then the west and south, part of the north half of the square, escaped fire, did the courthouse with valuable records, heroic efforts of a man and three or four boys, wedding blankets, and dashing water on Bob Black's livery stable northwest of Sorting Point, saved the southwest side of the square and the adjoining portions of the city. The article, a few days later, November 3rd, 1874, which read it if you'd like. This is a sample of that, just a portion of that article, it's a very long article, two whole columns, which describes just about, if not every, single business and home and that was consumed by the fire, and then the amount of their losses and whether or not they were covered by your insurance. If you'd like to pause, read this if you can, or go to the Hoosier Chronicles and get this article if you want to find out who those people were. Very interesting. And then, just a little bit later, November 11th, the Green Castle Council is purchased from J.C. J.G. Miller, a champion chemical fire extinguisher, and they're also bound to buy an engine. January 1875, members of the Green Council Fire Company are troubled to decide which style of uniforms to purchase with the proceeds of the fireman's ball. So this is when the Green Castle Fire Department was organized after the 1874 fire. So that's the documentation of when Green Council had its first fire department. And this is approximately the area that was consumed. You see the planning mill where it started, the post office, Jones Hotel, and then this is where the National Bank, when that old National Bank was, which was spared. And then this was the general area of the fire. Look at this photo. This is Putnam County Public Library. We're not real sure, but I'm confident this was a photo taken right after that fire. The standing near where pre roads used to be, looking northeast, just the south um, east corner of the square. And you see that this white house was spared, this two-story house, but everything else here was leveled. Then this building is leveled. I'm gonna show you a few more photos, talk about that. I want you to see this photo, which is several locations. You can see it at the coffee shop where pre roads used to be. All these buildings here were constructed after 1874 fire. You can see the Williamson building was built the next year. Most of these were 1875. Courthouse Square is um, still mostly grass. The, the first couple of courthouses were on the north side of the square, nowhere near as big as the current courthouse. And you can see it's mostly grassy, but I wanna show you this building here. I'm gonna zoom in on this. This is the National Bank or Old National Bank as we call it now building. You see the unique design of the windows and so forth. And then I put a portion of that photo where the fire was right beside this. You see this is, has to be that same building. So this is the southwest corner of the building and this is the southeast corner of that building. So we know that this photo is of the 1874 fire because of that. Very nice. And again, that article said this bank building was spared. All right, let's summarize what we've learned today. When was Green Castle founded? The land patent was applied for January of 1821, issued February of 1822, first settled by Dukes, according to John Jennings, in 1822. Dukes platted Green Castle, donated the land agent Amos Robertson, dated September 22nd, 1823, consideration of Green Castle being selected the seat of government, the seat of justice, the county seat. 
Sale of town lots occurred Monday, September 8, 1823. Dukes formally platted Green Castle and is recorded in 1824, but it had to plot it in 1823. Green Castle was incorporated as a town. March of 1849 became a city in 1861. So a, a question has arisen recently of when was Green Castle founded? There's a little bit of discussion and debate about what date to use, when it should be founded. We know it was founded by Ephraim Dukes. There's no question about that, of course, who never lived in Pennsylvania and definitely did not name Greencastle, Indiana after Greencastle, Pennsylvania. He probably named it, or possibly, I should say, let's head that a little bit, possibly named it after Greencastle, Ireland, which may or may not have been the ancestral home. We don't, we haven't been able to prove whether they came from Greencastle, Ireland, although we know they came from Ireland, possibly Greencastle, Ireland, maybe not, but definitely not Greencastle, Pennsylvania. We need to dispel that rumor once and for all. And based on the information since he, he plotted the town, 1823, which was not recorded to 1824, Greencastle was selected seat of justice in April or May of 1823, and then it, the land was transferred to Amos Robertson Land Agent 1820, and the first sale of loss for 1823. We can conclusively say without a doubt now, Green Castle was founded in 1823 by Ephraim Dukes. I hope you've enjoyed a little bit about the founding of Green Castle, and I hope you come back and here's some more about the early communities in our tiny towns, Fanny's Villages of Putnam County. Thank you.